All right. Thank you, everyone, so much for your patience. Um, I just had to make sure that everybody's mics and their video were turned off so that we can have a good presentation. Um, today we have a webinar uh, with Catherine Grant um, for the BYU Library Family History Webinar Series. And uh, we will be hearing about uh, the getting the most out of Family Search, um, the Family Tree uh, person page timeline. Um, and next week, we won't be having a webinar. We will um, have a webinar the 29th, and that'll be with Jean Nasbitt. Uh, she will be giving a presentation um, that Thursday, the 29th of November at 4 p.m. Um, Mountain Standard Time. And that'll be on um, where to begin research. And um, you always can uh, refer to our webinar recordings later on. Um, we do record them and they will be available um, after a week or so afterwards um, is typically when they get updated. And um, if you have any questions or concerns, you can email at FHL underscore webinars at BYU.edu or refer to our website, uh, which is right um, on the page. Uh, it also pops up just fine if you Google BYU Family History Library. And if we're ready... I will turn the time over to Catherine Grant, and um, we'll hear from her presentation. Great, Marin. Thank you so much. Let me just go ahead and get the uh, presentation shared here. Okay, there we go. Well, everybody, welcome today to our webinar on the new timeline on the person page. I have been so excited about this, and I hope that this is a, a valuable webinar for you in doing your family history. Let's take a look at what we'll be talking about today, our little agenda here. First of all, we'll get familiar with the timeline. We'll just kind of look at the basics of what it's used for, how it's laid out, and so forth. And then we will take a look at the different options, different ways for customizing the information that you see. And then finally, we'll give some examples of using the timeline for family history. So let's go ahead and dive in. Let's get familiar with the timeline. So here you see on the screen a screenshot of the timeline and let's talk about the purpose. I'm sure there's many different purposes that we could say for the timeline, but I wanted to highlight three of them. One is that it makes it easy and fun, honestly, to see the events in your ancestor's life. Then also, it can be used to help us improve accuracy and fill in gaps in our research. And then finally, maybe the best thing about it is that it helps us connect with our ancestors, helps us really feel a connection to those who have gone before. So, let's look at how it's laid out. On the left-hand side, you've got a text list of life events in chronological order. And then on the right, you see those same events plotted on a map. Now, in the middle, you'll see this, this handle right here. And if you want to resize the window, you can drag it one way or the other. For instance, if you needed more room to show the text, you could drag it over to the right. Or if you wanted the map to be bigger, then you'd drag it the opposite direction. So where does the information come from? Well, I think whoever designed this did it brilliantly. They're taking the information straight from the the sections of the details page on the person page. So I guess the details tab or details sub page, whatever you would call it. But all the information that is on that details page can be reflected in the timeline. And so the thing that I think is so brilliant about that is that then it doesn't get out of sync. You can just imagine what a mess it would be if you had one version of the birth in the timeline and another version of the birth on the details tab. It would just 
be a disaster. So basically, whatever you enter in one place or the other, it just stays consistent. So you notice here, I've got a little snippet from the vital section of the details tab. And we've got the birth information here for my uh, relative, John Bescoby. It's exactly the same over here on this screenshot from the timeline. And then also notice the same thing happens with the christening. It's just exactly the same information. And also for family members. So now you see the little uh, snippet on the left-hand side is a picture of all John William Bescoby's siblings. And then notice over on the right in the timeline, that information is reflected just exactly as it is on the person page or on the details page. Now you notice that there were some little icons next to the, let me go back for just a second. You notice there's little icons over here next to every event that shows up in the timeline. And it's just kind of a nice visual cue as to what that event is. I've listed here the most common ones, but there are some others. And you can kind of tell what they are, right? Because they're right next to the event, but it's just a nice, extra visual cue. So we've got a little baby in diapers for a birth. We've got a drop of water for christening since that was usually done by sprinkling in, in most churches. Uh, when it was infant baptism, we've got rings for marriage. We've got a guy rushing off to work for the occupation. Got a little flower for death and of course a tombstone for burial. So they're, they're kind of self-evident, but they again, they are just a nice visual cue to help you uh, see what kind of information you're looking at. So that's a basic overview of the, the layout and the purpose of the timeline. Now let's look at some of the options that you can use on the timeline. So first of all, you can totally customize what you want to show. Well, not totally. Okay, there's one little exception. You notice that down here, the vital events are checked, but they're grayed out. So anything from the vital section on the details tab is always going to show up on the timeline. You can't turn that off. But that's probably a good thing, right? Because who wants an empty timeline? But the rest of the stuff you can turn on or off as you want to, depending on what you want to focus on when you're looking at the timeline. So for instance, here's an example. Suppose that I wanted to just see the children of my relative. Maybe I wanted to see if there were big gaps or see if I had everybody. So I would uncheck everything except children. And when I do that, then the timeline reflects those changes. And actually there's not a save button or anything over here. You just, once you've made your selection, you just go ahead and click out of it and those changes are automatically reflected on the timeline. So you see over here, I've got my ancestor, my relative, he's actually a cousin, a distant cousin. I've got my cousin's uh, vital events here, the birth and the christening. But then also I've got just everything else to do with children and nothing else shows up on there. I don't have any record hints or custom events or anything like that. So that's a nice way of just focusing on something if you need that for your research. You can also add information to the timeline by um, clicking the little add button up there. Here, let's walk through an example. We notice here that uh, my Cousin Henry Bescoby has a birth and a christening and a death, but no burial. So, and I actually have that information, so I want to add that on the timeline. So I'm going to click Add, and I get this this uh, list of things that I can add and notice that burial is the only thing that is not dimmed out. So it's the only thing I can add from here. And that's because on the details tab, we've already got a birth christening and death. So the, the timeline assumes that I don't need to add that information. And indeed, if I wanted to edit it, I'd have to go back to the details tab. But for now, I just want to add the burial. So I go ahead and click burial. And you notice that this uh, form looks very familiar, and that's because it's exactly the same form that you would see if you had clicked Add Burial from the Details, uh, or from the Burial button in the Details tab. So it takes you to exactly the same form, which is great not only for consistency, but also that's how it keeps everything consistent between the timeline and the details page. So I just go ahead and fill out whatever information I want to add for the burial, and then I go ahead and click Save. 
and it shows up right here in the timeline. Now, you might be noticing that when I added the burial, I had an exact burial date, and now the burial shows up before the death. Well, hopefully we're not usually burying people <laughs> before they die. So why did this happen? Well, it's because on the death, I've only got a year. I don't have an exact date. So because there's no exact date, the timeline has no choice but to assume that it either that it happened either on the 31st of the year or sometime before. And since it doesn't know, it just acts like it's the 31st. So because of that, because it's assuming that the death took place on the 31st for lack of any other information, it put it after the burial. And the way to solve that is I need to go get the exact death date and uh, edit it and then it would show up in the correct order. And notice that I wanted to show you a picture of the de the details tab that this information was populated automatically into the vital section so that it doesn't get out of sync. Now, what if you want to edit information? The process is really similar. Instead of clicking that Add button, you just click Edit next to whatever you want to edit. It brings up that same form, and then when you save the information, it's populated both into the timeline and also onto the Details tab. Now let's look at one of the funnest features, which is the map. Now the map is shown by detail, but you don't have to have it. If you don't want the map on, for instance, you just want to focus on the text, you go ahead and slide that little um, white button over, and when you do that, the map disappears, and also the button becomes dimmed out. Well, it's real easy to put it back, of course. You just click it back to the way it was, and the map shows up again. Since Google Maps is used for the timeline, the features will probably be familiar to most of you who use Google Maps. So you've got your ability to zoom in and out here. If you want to zoom in and make the map bigger, you just click plus. And if you want to zoom out and see more of the country, you click the minus. Here's a really cool feature. If you want to see just one item highlighted on the map, you go ahead and click that in the timeline and it pops up a call out here on the map and you notice that the map marker turns green. So you know that that's the one that you're looking at and all these others just stay red, but you can see that particular item on the map but just by clicking in the timeline. Another thing that I totally love about this is that you can see a satellite view since this is Google Maps. So if you just click satellite and then you click something on the left of your timeline, it will actually show you where that event took place. And I don't know about you, but this just warms my heart. I just, I, I'm looking right now at the church where John was christened and that just, I don't know, that just means something to me to see where that event took place. I did have to zoom in on it, so I clicked the plus quite a bit so that I could get down and see the actual picture. And of course, this isn't from his time. You know, it's got the cars there that weren't there when he was christened, obviously. But still, just to see that church, it uh, just helps me feel more of a connection with him. So you could do that with any one of these items. Just click on them and go to satellite, zoom in, and see where that event actually took place. People have asked about printing the timeline. I checked around and it appears that at this point in time, it is not possible to print using any kind of a print function on the timeline, but you can print using the browser's print function. And for most browsers, that's going to be a control P if you're on a PC or a command P if you're on a Mac. The slight disadvantage is that you see, or excuse me, you get exactly what you see. Well, this timeline goes quite a bit further down, but if I were to do control P on my computer, I would just get this screen and nothing that went below. There are a couple of ways around that. You can obviously hit control P, print it, then scroll down to the next section, hit control P again. A little bit of a hacky solution, but if printing the timeline is important to you, at least that's one way to do it. There's another way that I, that might even be a little bit better, and that is to change the orientation on your screen. 
So for instance, in Windows, you can just go into Settings and you can change it. By default, it's usually Landscape, which means that it's wider than it is tall. But you can change the orientation to Portrait, which means that it's taller than it is wide. And that's what I did here on this screenshot. Screenshot. I had changed the orientation to portrait so I can see a lot more of the timeline. And then when I print, it's going to print everything that you see on the screen. So that's an option if printing the timeline is important to you. Okay, for the last part of our webinar, let's go ahead and look at using the timeline for some actual family history examples. Here we are, I'm looking at, oops, sorry, just advanced that accidentally. We are looking at the christening of my uh, cousin, John William Bescoby, and notice that it does not have a little map marker. And that indicates that this christening is not using a standardized place. If you look up here to the birth, it is using a map marker. So that means that when I entered that information, I did use a standardized place. Well, why do we care if it's standardized? For one thing, it's going to plot the location more accurately on the map. I'm sure that Family's Tree will do a pretty good job of plotting St. Botif. It's a pretty well-known place in Lincoln. So probably the map marker is going to be pretty close on that one. But if we want to be absolutely sure that it's as accurate as it can be, then you do want to go ahead and standardize that. And so you just click Edit and standardize it the way you normally do on the Details tab of the Person page. The other benefit to improving accuracy is that you may get better record hints because the record hints are based on the information that is displayed on the, the, the person page or in the timeline. The looking at the timeline also gives you an opportunity to find more accurate information where you see that it, it's maybe not as accurate as it could be. This uh, information about Henry, John's sibling, is a great example. All we've got here is an about birth date and an abbreviated ENG, England for the country. My guess is on that, I actually didn't test this out, but I'm guessing that if the map tried to plot that, it would just stick it smack dab into the middle of England. And obviously, that's not a, a necessarily very accurate. So if I want this to be more accurate, I would go back. And here, for whatever reason, I don't have an edit button. I just noticed that. I bet it's because we'd have to actually go to Henry's page. So go to the siblings page, and then we'd get the edit button. And we would edit that information. And when we did, it would show up more accurately on John's page, on his brother's page. Another thing that's great about the timeline is that it makes it easy to see missing vital events. So you remember from before, I commented that I did already have the birth, christening, and death information for John. So that's all dimmed out, but I see that the burial isn't dimmed out. So that makes it really obvious that I still need to add burial information. Another thing I love about the timeline view is that it makes it very easy to see gaps in information. So notice up here that John and his wife Caroline got married in 1901, but we don't have a first child in 1904. Well, maybe it took a while before they got pregnant, but I look down here and I see the next child's 1906, the next child's 1908. So they're having kids pretty regularly. So that makes me think that it's probably worth it for me to look and see if there's a missing child. Maybe their first baby died and so that baby didn't show up in the census and the only way I could find the child was maybe to look in uh, christening records or go to the general register office site since this is England, something like that. But it is worth it for me to look and see if there's a child missing. And also, I look down here further in the timeline, and I see that John had a child when he was age 31. That's pretty young, actually, and there's no children showing after that time. It makes me think maybe I need to look for children that were born after Leonard's birth. And then also I look down here and I see that Leonard died in 1942. He was actually killed in action in World War II. 
but that's a pretty long gap here to go from 1908 to 1942 with no information about anything else in my ancestor's life. So that kind of highlights that I've got a pretty big gap there and I might want to look and see are there more kids, are there more life events that could be added? So I can make that, that record for John as accurate as possible. Oh my goodness, another thing I love is that you have the ability to see record hints on the timeline. So I've actually gone to a different relative here to my cousin Charlotte because she actually had a lot of record hints and I wanted to show you what that looked like. So in order to see the record hints about people in my ancestor or cousin's life, I go ahead and click show and I get this menu down here and I unclick everything except record hints and then also relationships. So I leave those all clicked, but I unclick everything else because I just want to focus on the record hints for these relationship events. So when I do that, this is what I get. I get the timeline with record hints inserted next to the event that they probably apply to. Now, of course, they don't always apply. I'm sure you've had that experience of once in a while. It's pretty rare, actually. Family Search has done such a good job on this but um, once in a while there'll be a hint that you don't want to attach but most of the time you will click this review and attach button and you will look at that hint and it'll probably look pretty good and you'll be able to attach it to your ancestor so this is a great way of seeing where there are records that you could add again to improve the accuracy and the validity of that that person's record that you're looking at so that brings us to the end of our webinar today. And just by way of a summary, we first of all got familiar with the timeline. We talked about the purpose and how it's laid out and where the information comes on, comes from. That it's, it's all the same information, whether you're on the details tab or the timeline. It's just populated into both places, so you never have to worry about it getting out of sync. We looked at the timeline options, which let you decide what you want to display. They let you add and edit information. They let you see the events on a map. And you they don't exactly let you print, but you can print using the browser's print function. And then we looked at using the timelines for some family history examples. So that brings us to the end of our webinar. And everybody, thank you so much for attending today. And Marin, do we have any questions? Um, it looks like we don't have any questions right now, um, but everyone is welcome to use the chat feature, which is on their menu bar, if you would like to have your questions addressed. Well, if we don't have any more questions, uh, since Catherine did a very thorough and uh, short video, uh, we can move over to the end screen. Um, you're welcome to still use the chat. Um, and we encourage you to continue to explore the timeline feature on uh, Family Search and the Family Tree option. Um, it looks like we do have one, um, one question here in the chat. Uh, Randy says, what are the advantages of standardizing places? Oh, Randy, that is a super question because I know sometimes as we're, you know, entering information, we think, well, is it worth it to take the time to do that? And one major reason is that if the system recognizes the standard place, it's more likely to find record hints. And then also it's going to plot more accurately on the map. And there probably are other benefits. Um, just another benefit I can think of off the top of my head is that sometimes I see records that have, they came from the old extraction program where dates and places weren't standard. And you might have things that are misspelled or abbreviated, and they might not be clear to everybody who's looking at that information. So when you have a standard place, it, it just means the information is complete and accurate, and it's going to be something that all users can understand instead of 
something that maybe is abbreviated in a strange way that some people might not understand, especially if they're not from that country. Oh my goodness, I just thought of another one. I've noticed on some old records, sometimes California is abbreviated as CA, but so is Canada. So if you look at that old record and you see the abbreviation of CA, well, you may not know right off what it really is. And it's much better to use a standardized place so that everybody knows that really is Canada or that really is California. So thanks very much for that question. So I see another question, is FamilySearch planning more features with standardized places? I haven't heard of anything coming, but FamilySearch is constantly improving, so it actually wouldn't surprise me. And then also, for those of you who are interested, FamilySearch actually has a a site where you can look up standardized places. And if you're interested in that, uh, I, my email was displayed at the end of the webinar. So you can email me about that. Or actually, Marin, we could uh, post that on the YouTube page, I, I suppose, in the comments or wherever we wanted to. So maybe we should just do that, post the link to the standardization site. Dee, I'm not sure that I understand your question. Is this like Twill? Oh, I think I know what you mean, the app, the Twi Twilo app or whatever. And you know what? I have to admit, I saw that app at Roots Tech, but I've never used it personally. And so I apologize. I don't know the answer to that question. But does anybody else on the, on the webinar know the answer to that? If so, maybe you could type the answer into the chat box. So it is a timeline. So I would guess that it's similar. Ah, Cindy has. Oh, that's cool. So in, it, I don't even know how you say that, Twilly, Twily, but you can apparently add pictures to the timeline there. That's awesome. Does anyone know, Cindy, do you know the URL to that? Is it just twil twily.com maybe? You could probably Google it and find it. Thank you. Okay, so I love this interactive chat. This is so cool. All right, thank you everyone for um, continuing to uh, ask questions and be engaged in our webinar. Um, we're grateful for the time that you spent with us. Uh, we're having a webinar, not next Thursday, but on the 29th. Uh, we hope that you have a wonderful uh, wonderful weekend and a wonderful Thanksgiving. Thank you so much and have a wonderful night.